Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, the Director of Events, and I'm very excited to welcome Nick Redding and Samuel Friedman here tonight to discuss the New York Times bestseller, Methland, The Death and Life of an American Small Town. Featured on the cover of the Times Book Review and listed among the year's 100 notable books, Methland won the 2009 Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize, as well as the 20, 2010 Hillman Prize for Book Journalism. The book was picked as a best book of the year by the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch, the Chicago Tribune, and the Seattle Times. In January 20, uh, 2010, the British Broadcasting Corporation purchased global movie rights to the book. Nick Redding, journalist and native Midwesterner, spent four years living off and on reporting in the small town of Oline, yeah. right. Iowa. He has worked as a magazine editor, a graduate school professor, and a freelance writer. Samuel G. Friedman is an, an award-winning author, columnist, and professor. A columnist for the New York Times and a professor at Columbia University, he is the author of six acclaimed books, most recently Who She Was, My Search for My Mother's Life, and Letters to a Young Journalist. Following their discussion, Nick and Sam would be happy to take your questions. We'll be walking around with this microphone, so please wait for that before you speak. They will then sign copies of their books for you, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming the award-winning authors, Samuel G. Friedman and Nick Redding to the Strand. Uh, thanks very much, and welcome, everybody, to this uh, consecrated ground of literary life in New York, uh, which is the Strand Bookstore. Um, Christina asked me earlier, had I been here and I promised to withhold the footnote on that till now and I'll just say uh, about 26 years ago one of my great journalistic mentors Arthur Gelb at the New York Times asked me to write a magazine article about intellectual life in New York and left it totally up to me how to define it or where to center it and one of the places I wrote about back then was The Strand and how Tom Verlaine and Patti Smith among many others had been booksellers here so it's wonderful to be here, and also before going further, I should uh, uh, introduce you to one of the great publishers in New York, George Gibson, who's in the back, who's been a wonderful publisher at Walker and Bloomsbury, and has brought a lot of great writers, including Nick Redding, out into the literary world. So we're glad to have George with us. And our format will be for Nick and I to converse for the first half hour or so, and then open it up to your questions. And um, Nick, I guess I'll start it this way. I may be relatively rare in this room for having passed through Elwine. Um, I went to college in Madison. I had a newspaper job in Minneapolis. My sister went to college in Iowa City at the university. And so I can visualize this town. Um, for me, it's not flyover country, but maybe drive-through country. But the place that I drove through and I think about, you know, grain elevators and, um, you know, the German food in the Amana colonies, which aren't so far away, and, um, you know, pan signs for pancake breakfasts on the firehouse and all these staples of the Midwest, the supper clubs, the little nine-hole golf courses on the outskirts of town. But you introduce us to a place that's partly that, but partly non that or anti that or that gone through some terrible reversal. And for everyone who hasn't driven through and who hasn't read the book yet, and I hope you all will, this is, I have to tell you, as somebody who teaches nonfiction, an extraordinary book, really a remarkable piece of writing and reporting, but also moral witness. But for those who haven't, what was the L wine that you found there? Um, I, you know, I think the... Um I think the old wine that I expected to find, despite going there uh, with the idea I was going to write a book about the meth epidemic, is kind of the one that you're talking about. I mean, I I, I grew up um, in the area, roughly speaking, and um, it was, uh, I think it was shocking to me to, I mean, there's all the same things that you're talking about. There's still the grain elevators and the, um, and the supper clubs and the nine-hole golf courses and all that. Um, but a lot of it's in disuse, and um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that the sort of signs of entropy that had um, uh, that had become so apparent. 
to someone from there may not have been to someone who was driving through. Um, it's not like everything has fallen down. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think I, I sort of found a place that essentially felt as though it was in the midst of being abandoned. And so everything, uh, things still stood, but people didn't necessarily stand inside of them anymore. Um, and uh, that, was, it, that was even a little bit shocking to me, I have to say. You know, um, among the other people from the AARP contingent in this room, I'm old enough to remember New York during the crack era and what it was like to go through a city that was really being convulsed by a drug epidemic, but also old enough to have lived through fear-mongering about epidemics that weren't as terrible mm -hmm. as forecast. What can you situate the meth epidemic as you saw it there and reported it on that spectrum? You know, how terrible was it and was it ginned up for or, you know, exaggerated in the media or was there something genuinely frightful there? And, and if it was, what made it so frightful? Um, I, I don't think it was something that was uh, hyperbolized um, I think that in terms of uh, uh, the spectrum of, of drug epidemics, um, the rural United States had never been included in that spectrum. And I think that was part of what felt um, shocking to people in the media um, and yet managed to sort of miss the point. Because there was this idea of um, you know, how can people who live in the middle of the country um, have a drug problem? And, and there was this kind of uh, constant drone note that was struck in the media about, isn't it amazing people make a drug in their bathtub, for instance? But the, I think the, the, the subtext of that surprise was less um, the notion that you know, meth is a bad drug, then we can't believe these are the people that are doing it because we associate drugs with, you know, the inner city, whatever the inner city is. I, um, and so I think that its place on the spectrum was in that way um, just a little bit of an exercise in missing the point. But how did it change life day to day? I mean, what did meth do to old wine? Um, well, you know, the... If you look at it in, in terms of like a 30-year sort of economic and, and, um, and, and social and, and cultural decline, um, the, you know, the last 40 years in, in, in economic history in the middle of the country has been one that is, is a little bit of a, of, of a set piece. I mean, first, for instance, uh, heavy manufacturing went away. Um, a lot of transportation went away in the form of the railroad, and then uh, farms were consolidated. So these are sort of three pillars upon which um, life had been built since the colonizing of the area. Um, and so meth sort of came at the end of that. And what was particularly insidious about it is that this was a, 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 it was a criminalized way to make a living that was that filled a sort of a, a very specific economic need but it's filled it in a way that was perhaps more insidious than 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 other drugs because you could make it right there it wasn't something that necessarily had to be brought in um and and so 